Hi, welcome back to The Progressive Primitivist, where we believe the only way to go forward in religion is to go back to the Bible. There may not be a more villainized individual amongst Churches of Christ as Rubel Shelley. And recently, Caleb Robertson did a sit-down interview with Dr. Shelley, where Dr. Shelley talks about his life and his rise and his fall amongst conservative a cappella Churches of Christ. During the course of the interview, uh, Caleb brings up a book that Dr. Shelley wrote called Sing His Praise as a Case for Acapella Music as Worship Today. In a way, this was a love letter back to conservative churches of Christ to let them know that he was changing, but he wasn't changing entirely. And in 1988, he presented three lessons on this topic from his book at the ACU Lectures. And so you are listening to one of those three lectures today. We think that you're going to enjoy these lectures. And thank you for being here to be a part of this. Well, some Texans say this is an early morning session. I mean, I've, I've been working a long time by now at home, and I'm still getting up on that schedule. So here in late morning, it's good to be with you, and I appreciate your choosing to be in this session. With so many things going on, the choices are, are difficult, and I appreciate your choosing to be here. This is the first opportunity I've ever had to be on the program at Abilene Christian during lectureship week, and that's an honor. And when you're in Nashville, I invite you to let me return hospitality to you, and I hope you'll visit with us at Ashwood. In this session, in fact, in a series of three classes, we're going to talk about a position that historically is very important to our people. It's one of the things for which we have identity in the religious world, a rather distinctive position with regard to the non-use of instrumental music in worship. It is a position that I believe is right, or I would not be part of this fellowship, or at least this branch of this fellowship, that considers this a distinctive worth maintaining. I do not regard our position on instrumental music to be the same in importance as our position on the deity of Christ or the essentiality of baptism. I do believe one can come to the Lord and be a child of God and be wrong about instrumental music. This is a question of faithfulness in the kingdom. It's not a matter of admission into the kingdom. But that's not said to minimize it, but simply to put it in perspective. And I mention that because occasionally when we use the term Church of Christ, we use it in such a sectarian way that we exclude from membership in the Church of Christ anyone who holds a different view on this subject than we do, even though he may have come to believe and to have obeyed the same gospel that we've accepted. For example, recently in one of our Brotherhood papers, there was a survey of the state of churches of Christ in our neighbor to the north, Canada. I probably would not have noticed it, probably would not have really had that much interest in it because I'm not Canadian don't know a lot of people in Canada, but the week before that was published, I had been in Canada at Maritime Christian College, a little Christian college operated by Churches of Christ on Prince Edward Island. It's a very small school, four faculty members and 23 students. But in the daytime, during their lecture week, they had about 250 brothers and sisters out of that fellowship, and in the evening, 350 or so. I spoke at two different congregations while I was up there. Had to go up early enough to be there over the weekend. Spoke at one congregation that morning, another that night. So against that background of having been in two different locations where Churches of Christ were meeting there and speaking on their lectureship at a school supported by them, that I was informed in that report that church leaders say there are no churches of Christ in either Prince Edward Island or, on, or in the province of Newfoundland. Well, I think that simply reflects the fact that whereas in the Yellow Pages we're sometimes listed as churches of Christ a cappella or non-instrument and churches of Christ instrumental, 
But we sometimes use the term in such a sectarian way that we use it to exclude anyone who differs from us or that I would believe to be wrong on the issue of instrumental music. I do not believe that this is an issue that determines one's ability to be included in the kingdom of God or to be regarded as a member of the church if you use that term in a non-sectarian sense to refer to the church as it is revealed in the New Testament. Just as there might have been some people at Antioch or Ephesus and probably several at Corinth that I would not want to affirm in terms of some things that were going on with them, they were still in fact the church of God at Ephesus or at Antioch or even at Corinth. So we're talking about an issue that is historically very important to us. And yet we're talking about an issue that in terms of, of biblical priority does not have the essential nature, the priority nature, as the foundation, core issues of Christian faith, but have to do with church life and worship where the issue is not inclusion in the kingdom of God, but faithfulness. And I think that's the distinction we must keep in mind so that we don't fall into the trap of using the term Church of Christ denominationally and identifying a number of creedal tenets, principal among those being the non-use of instrumental music in worship. So I'm talking about a subject that is important to me personally because I am of this heritage and I am of this conviction and I do believe it is a matter of faithfulness in the body to be as loyal to the Word of God as one can be and to follow the directions of the New Testament as faithfully as one can and I believe one does that in a cappella worship as opposed to instrumental music. So I'll be trying this morning as the day progresses to approach this subject from three different vantage points and to pull together some information for you. You might be interested in a little book if, if you want some of the uh, more detailed presentation and footnotes and so on. Most of the material that I'm going to be delivering is in a little book called Sing His Praise. It's been out a few months. The subtitle is A Case for Acapella Music as Worship Today. And interestingly, I wrote this book at the request of people in the Churches of Christ instrumental or some parts of the country, independent Christian churches. As I had occasion to be with some of these people, to get to know some of them, um, I was asked by them to represent the views that I hold on instrumental music. Um, and I've attempted to do so in this book. We've made some very, very poor arguments over the years, some very silly arguments over the years in support of our case that people on the opposite side of the aisle or opposite side of the keyboard have taken and created a caricature of our position in order to knock down the straw man. This is an attempt to put together information in a concise way. It's a very brief thing, but, but what I believe to be the solid information that supports the position that um, I hold. And it has been circulated now for a few months, and you might be interested in a copy of it. You well know that there are certain parts of the country where this identity crisis, uh, Church of Christ, instrumental, non-instrumental, is, is more presenting than it is maybe in Texas or Tennessee. In Tennessee, Churches of Christ means the a cappella wing out of the Restoration Movement. Independent or conservative Christian church would mean the folks who are basically like us, except for piano or organ. But you can go into certain parts of the country, and some of you may have had this experience, as, as others of us have, and you're visiting, and you don't know people in the area, and you don't know church situations in the area, and you look in the phone book, and you find Church of Christ at X address, and you go by, and you get there right at service time, and as you're walking in, you hear something that you're not accustomed to hearing. Well, it says Church of Christ over the door, but when you walk in, you see something that you don't find in the one back home with that sign over the door. What is there about our position that is distinctive, and is it one that's worth maintaining? A Roman Catholic writer who took, position, uh, took note of our position of opposition to instrumental music and worship has done a better than average job in explaining it, and I'm quoting from an article out of U.S. Catholic entitled The Churches of Christ, quote, their favorite motto, coined by an early 19th century preacher, where the scriptures speak, we speak, where the scriptures are silent, we are silent, has led them into polemical battle against all other Christians, Protestant and Catholic. For example, 
The use of mechanical music in worship has been denounced as evidence of apostasy for more than a century. Obviously, the scriptures do not speak of pianos and pipe organs. Neighbors who visit our services for the first time or who know anything about us at all probably know us in relation to our non-use of instrumental music. And sometimes I have been amused and have tried to be kind in, in responding to someone at the back door who says, well, preacher, can you all not afford a piano for your church? Well, we probably could if we thought it was something we needed to have. We have generally good credit at all the banks. Uh, our non-use of it has to do with principle, not simply a matter of affordability. And in the three presentations that I'm going to make, I want to look at what I think are the three issues that, that are critical. And the one this morning, I want to look really at, at the theology and the hermeneutical principle that has to do with uh, the use or non-use of instrumental music. Later in the day, I want to look at well, in the second speech, the musical vocabulary of the New Testament moved from theology to, to biblical textual study and especially a little linguistic material. And then in the third session, the final one of the afternoon, I want to look at some things out of the history of the church, early church history, and even modern American church history, and some of the things that pertain to our position on it. Getting to the matter of theology and hermeneutics, where I think the battle is, is, is really pitched and where it must be joined, a New Testament teaching that is fundamental to the idea of restoration and that is part and parcel of the whole idea of a restoration movement is that everything that we believe, teach, and practice must have divine authority. Uh, the thus saith the Lord principle. Hear words from Paul in Colossians 3.17, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now this expression, in the name of the Lord Jesus, is a loaded phrase and carries a lot of weight and a lot of baggage. But among the things that it does mean, I'm convinced that it also means that it is to be done in light of and in harmony will the revelation of God's will to mankind. To do it in the name of is to do it on the authority of, to do it with the approval of Jesus. Well, of course, the authority of God is inherent in every word of Scripture, and Scripture furnishes us completely to every good work before God. And Christians are people who are trying to walk by faith, People are trying to honor Scripture and to do things according to the directions given to us that we regard as normative in the Word of God. And for us to live by faith is to direct our ways by the revealed will of God. Our limited insights into the mind of God through our own reflections and deductions are just that, limited insights. I do believe in what one can call general revelation about God that comes to us through nature and reason and reflection. But through general revelation, you can't know a great deal about the specifics of God's will for the conduct of a human life. There is where you go to the Word of God, propositional revelation from God. And with regard to things such as our worship, where general revelation may inspire awe and a sense of desire to worship, specific revelation in Scripture has to provide the guidelines for the content of that worship. And if there's no authority from the message of Christ for a given doctrine or practice, then that thing needs to be avoided. Otherwise, we are not acting within the parameters of this commitment, this principle to do everything in the name of Jesus. Well, those are very general principles and, and a very summary statement of things that are part and parcel of the whole idea of restoration, that there is something in Scripture that's normative, that's to be preserved, that in the life of the church is to be perpetuated. They might have to be argued in more detail in some settings, but, uh, but not here, and not in, not in this context, I'm sure. To give a specific application of it that I'll be referring back to two or three times this morning. 
Alexander Campbell, for example, rejected sprinkling as an acceptable form of baptism on the grounds of this principle that I've just enunciated around Colossians 3.17. He rejected it because of the failure of God to authorize its use. And, his de- and in his debates with Walker and McCullough and Rice, he never claimed that Scripture condemns sprinkling. For him to have claimed that would have been to claim too much. He did not make the unjustified claim that a statement could be produced from the New Testament that says a fusion is wrong and we are not to sprinkle. Well, in their consistent and emphatic rejection of sprinkling for baptism, those early Restoration leaders pointed to the absence of either a New Testament command for sprinkling or data in Scripture or early church history that the primitive body of Christ used sprinkling. And from that silence, as they came to call it, they inferred that immersion alone had divine authority, and they subsequently not only did not practice effusion, but they, they opposed it and said that it was outside the realm of faithfulness to the Word of God. Well, the opposition that I make to the use of instrumental music in worship is based on that same form of reasoning. I do not claim to be able to produce an explicit prohibition of instrumental music as worship from the New Testament. There is certainly no command for instrumental accompaniment to Christian musical praise in the New Testament, nor is there any data in Scripture or early church history to show that the primitive body of Christ used it, and from that silence... I infer that singing alone has divine authority and that instrumental accompaniment to singing is outside the parameters of biblical authority available to us. And in passing, I I think it should be noticed that those of us who don't use instrumental music in worship are generally assumed to bear the burden of proof to justify our position because it's a minority view. As a matter of fact, we've typically been defensive and quick to offer arguments and proofs uh, that instrumental music shouldn't be used. But the burden of proof logically belongs to the people who use it, not to us for our non-use. By analogy, I have no obligation to justify my non-effusionist practice by making a case against sprinkling. Only if Scripture somehow mandated sprinkling would I bear the burden of proof to justify my failure to do it. Since I'm an immersionist, my only burden of proof is to immersion. That's really all I have to justify, that what I'm doing is authorized. Similarly, I don't have any logical obligation to justify my non-instrument position by making a case against pianos and organs in Christian worship. Only if somewhere in the New Testament those things were mandated would I have any obligation to justify a cappella worship. Since I worship God with vocal praise, my only logical obligation, my only rational obligation, is to produce authority from that, for that practice. Now, I can do that, but it's only because we're in the historic context of this having been a point of tension that we feel compelled, and I think are at a practical level compelled, not logical now, but practical level, to justify the position we hold. It'd certainly be a mistake to suppose that anything not expressly forbidden in Scripture is therefore authorized by default. We don't reason that way with regard to anything else. If it were the case that anything not expressly forbidden is permissible, we could not only use pianos in our worship, but I'd see no reason uh, for opposing the use of, of crucifixes to focus devotion or any number of other things that uh, while not a part of Scripture, not a part of the life of the early church, and not commanded, nevertheless some people choose to use. If, If that principle is not correct, I think we could also initiate an organizational network, very similar to that which is common in the Catholic and Protestant world, where you have some sort of hierarchical arrangement. Well, there's no New Testament command for that. Well, same thing's true. Uh, that simply because there's no prohibition, however, why couldn't we do that? I don't think we can, don't think we ought to, and I think it's the same principle at work. If, in fact, you can do anything not expressly forbidden, I don't see why we couldn't finance church projects with bingo games, where that's legal, uh, on Tuesday evenings or whatever night. Uh, 
Not one of those things is expressly forbidden, and the list can go on. Not one of those is explicitly forbidden in the New Testament, and nobody who denies the legitimacy of, of the authority principle as I've outlined it above could, could argue consistently against their inclusion. Well, that authority principle, though, says you have to have something other than a prohibition. You have to have authority for it. Where is the authority for an organization beyond the local church? Where is the authority for financing the life of the church and its projects through something other than the free will contributions of its members? Where is the authority for using the crucifix or other devotional objects? Well, it's in the absence of that authority, the silence of the New Testament on those things, that I find my ground for opposing and refusing any part in it. The principle of allowing anything not specifically forbidden pushed to its ultimate conclusion would really admit anything that a person might desire into the service of God, and we become totally subjective at that point. We simply do whatever tickles our fancy so that every man would become a law to himself. And if the gospel is to be preached and the church preserved in anything like an attempt to restore what was there in, in the primitive body of Christ, a principle like that just isn't admissible. Things cannot be allowed to become that subjective, and we cannot take that, that plunge. On the other hand, I want to balance that by saying it would also be a mistake to think that silence is never concessive, because every one of us understands silence at times to concede the right to do things. For example, there's no command for us to purchase property. There's no command or example in the New Testament of building church buildings or to appoint real estate trustees to execute deeds on property. Neither is there any precedent in the New Testament where any of these things was done. And similar observations could be made about communion wear and electric lights and air conditioning and public address systems and four-part harmony and songbooks and tuning forks and Christian colleges and lots of other things. And at times, frankly, you suspect that what one allows and prohibits is due more to taste and temperament rather than to any carefully thought through and articulated doctrine of biblical authority and any really good hermeneutic. Now, whether that's so or not, responsible Christians who are concerned about biblical interpretation have to try to have a hermeneutic that's sound and constructive. Now, the one that we work with, our command example inference hermeneutic, needs work, doesn't need to be rejected out of hand. But as we presently understand and use it in all segments of the restoration movement, it does allow a great deal of subjectivity, and it needs refinement. And that's the challenge, it seems to me, to this generation of, of theologians and New Testament scholars. A conscientious effort has to be made to, to keep each of us from becoming a law to himself by having a hermeneutic that's consistent and practical. And on this point of <clears throat> exclusion, I think it is wrong and I think it is an overstatement to say that every time there is a statement or command of Scripture, anything other than that which is explicitly named is by implication condemned and excluded. I think there is a matter of looking for some prima facie good cause to find an exclusionary intent in a command or statement before you can read exclusion into it. I do not believe, for example, that the command to assemble without any command or precedent about church buildings or air conditioning automatically excludes those unnamed things, owning property, building a building, or air conditioning. On the other hand, I do believe that what we are told both by command and, and precedent about the musical praise of the church does have an exclusionary intent. And we haven't talked much about that in our hermeneutic. We haven't had a base for doing it, and I'm asking that, that we begin to, to, to explore it. How does one find an exclusionary intent in what an author says? Well, I think one has to look at the much larger context of his work and the historical setting in which the work is done to see if there is any good reason to believe there is an exclusionary intent. And that's why when we discuss musical vocabulary and history this afternoon, I believe there I can establish 
the clear exclusionary intent of the New Testament documents with regard to instrumental music. I do not believe there is any such exclusionary intent that can be established with regard, say, to church buildings or air conditioning. But that's a point that, that must be raised as we work with hermeneutics. And if, if you wrestle with hermeneutics, if that's a concern of yours, I hope you'll think about just that sort of parenthesis. And you'll understand and appreciate where I think the burden of the research has to be done. Is there good cause for thinking that a given statement has exclusionary intent? And in the absence of good cause for believing there is an exclusionary intent, I do not believe you can use a command or example to exclude at all. From the study of Scripture, you, you have to believe that in some instances, uh, a command or precedent is to be understood as having exclusionary intent. Silence in some instances must be understood as prohibited. Take the argument from the book of Hebrews about Christ's priesthood as a case in point. In the course of an argument showing that there had been a change of covenants in order to accommodate what God had done through Christ to bring redemption to his human brothers, great emphasis is given to the unnamed writer of Hebrews on an argument from silence that the old covenant given through Moses was temporary and destined to be replaced by a new one is held by the writer of Hebrews to be implied in the anointing of Jesus to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So he writes at Hebrews 7, beginning at 11, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the law was given to the people, why was there still need for another priest to come? One like Melchizedek, not like Aaron. For when there's a change of priesthood, there must also be a change of law. What? He of whom these things are said, Jesus, of course, belongs to a different tribe. Not Levi, but... And no one from that tribe, Judah, Jesus' tribe, has ever served at the altar. For it's clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and that in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. Now, if... if I am doing legitimate exegesis of that text at all. The writer is saying there's clear exclusionary intent in the Old Testament statement about priesthood. Now, there is no Old Testament statement. You shall not take a priest from this, 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 or the other. But he says there, there's clearly exclusionary intent when God, out of those tribes, identifies and selects and says they are to be taken from this tribe. There's no explicit prohibition of priests out of Judah. What is contained in the law is authorization for priests out of Levi. So a command or law or other authoritative statement authorizes only what it authorizes, doesn't have to exclude all the alternatives by means of detailed prohibitions. But even so, you have to be careful about reading exclusive and exclusionary intent into every statement of Scripture unless there's good reason to think exclusionary intent is there in the larger historical grammatical setting of the statement. Now, we can bring that principle into our own culture and illustrate it a thousand ways. A physician's prescription for penicillin doesn't have to forbid the pharmacist from uh, dispensing some other antibiotic. The prescription just authorizes whatever it authorizes. Well, are you saying we should understand Scripture as a physician's prescription? No, I'm simply illustrating a principle. But we understand very often that there are circumstances where specifying a thing does have exclusionary intent. A customer's order for item number X44G doesn't have to exclude every other item in the mail order catalog but it's generally understood to authorize only what's named on the order blank. Well, are you saying Scripture is a mail-order catalog of commands, and are you falling into and lapsing into legalism? Well, I hope not. I don't see Scripture that way. I'm simply saying that in many areas of life, in medicine and in, in, in business, one can construct without being far-fetched at all a scenario where in specifying something, you do indicate an exclusionary intent. Well, is there any good reason to believe that in Scripture the references to singing have any exclusionary intent? 
Well, as a matter of common sense, we all understand, I think, that every form of authorization in, in medicine, mail order catalogs, or scripture is more or less specific and has certain inclusive and exclusive features. And you have to study the whole thing and its larger implications. So, against that context, and with the proviso that our hermeneutic is, is while not altogether defective, I wouldn't want to use that word, it, it's, it's terribly incomplete. It needs more work. I do want to come back now to the specific matter of Scripture and how you interpret Scripture and how you work with a hermeneutic. Let's go back to Campbell and those early restorers and their rejection of sprinkling as baptism. When Campbell and his peers rejected sprinkling as an acceptable form of baptism, they did so on the basis of reasoning that follows the pattern I've tried to walk through very simply. He observed that the New Testament did not contain a broad command such as perform a religious ceremony with water in order to admit people into the body of Christ. If that had been the biblical authorization, any method from full immersion to sprinkling would have satisfied the command. Broad as that command would have been, it though would still have had some exclusive force. It would certainly have ruled out religious rites that don't involve water in any way as suitable for that entrance rite. Campbell argued that Scripture authorizes a specific act. was really illogical. Since the command to baptize is specific as to the action indicated, that carried the notion with it of exclusionary intent, and that it was only that action, immersion, which was intended to be authorized by that statement. The exclusion is not based on the silence of the New Testament on sprinkling so much as the authority that God gave for immersing. The silence of the New Testament, though, and the evidence that sprinkling was not practiced until a later date, those things do have a bearing. The fact that baptism was commanded would not have excluded sprinkling if there had been any other direct statement of Scripture indicating that sprinkling was also authorized of God. If the New Testament and early church history showed that sprinkling was practiced, then its approval might be shown by, by precedent. But silence in those two areas, no New Testament command to sprinkle, and no precedent, no example, no case study of sprinkling in the New Testament or early church history, the silence of those two areas coupled with the specific commandment about immersing meant in their understanding of Scripture and in mine that the practice of substituting, sprinkling or pouring for immersion is, is unscriptural and wrong and therefore not to be advocated. Even with a command that's specific as to the action of baptism, there do remain certain areas of silence where I think the silence is concessive. Is immersion to be performed in running or still water? Well, there have been hot debates over that. But I see no rational way of reading any exclusionary intent into the statement about baptism that, de that decides that issue. And what, if anything, is to be said over the candidate seeking immersion? Well, we've debated that one too. We've killed trees and poured out ink over that one. I don't know that anything has to be said. And if you choose to say something, I certainly don't believe that it has to be said in any prescribed formula. Should one's baptism be a public ceremony performed before the church in plenary session, or should it be a private affair? Well, I believe all those things where Scripture is silent, are things wherein judgment can be used and where that silence is to be understood as concessive. Because there's nothing about the historical context of the early church's baptizing of people into the name of Jesus, and there's 
there's nothing from, from early church history to show that there was anything about any of these issues where the command itself or the precedent could have been fairly understood to have exclusionary intent. And it's precisely that same pattern of reasoning that those of us who argue for a cappella music as the appropriate form of musical praise in the church use in making our case. If God had authorized Christians to make musical praise to God, it would have been our choice to do so by vocal music, instrumental music, or combined vocal and instrumental music. But the New Testament doesn't contain that sort of general, broad authorization for music of unspecified origin and nature. To the contrary, as we'll notice this afternoon, the musical vocabulary of the New Testament employs words that indicate the specific action of vocal praise. And both the New Testament and early church history that we'll look at in detail later in the afternoon point to the exclusive use of vocal music for divine praise and mutual exhortation among Christians. So, with a clear command and, precedence for, and precedent for singing vocal music, and in light of the silence of New Testament authority for instrumental music as praise to God, I believe that it's excluded in the same way that authority for immersion excludes the legitimacy of sprinkling. And I think the principle is legitimate enough that if, if I have to give it up on one, I don't see how consistently I can stay with it on the other. And it becomes a sort of slippery slope for me. With specific authority for vocal music, there do still remain some areas of silence where we use human judgment. Shall we print words and or music? Or shall we sing only from memory? Shall we sing in unison or with four-part harmony? Well, I, I don't know of any way to find any definitive statement from Scripture to indicate an exclusionary intent in any direction on those questions. So Scripture, authorizing as it does with varying degrees of specificity, when it authorizes an act without stating the method of accomplishment, I think the silence on those particulars is to be understood as concessive to human judgment, concessive to human initi initiative, even to some degree to human creativity. And both the letter and spirit of the Christian system are preserved. When it authorizes a specific activity, however, its silence about related actions narrows you to the activity identified and therefore seems to carry with it some exclusionary intent to eliminate methods not authorized elsewhere. Now, if you take this point a bit further and, and reflect on it just a bit, I think you'll see that uh, we have, out of the Old Testament, precedent to this effect. If saying that every time there is a command, there is exclusionary intent, then in the Old Testament, the commands about singing would have to be understood to exclude instrumental music even under the Old Testament, but no. Under the Old Testament, you have the additional statements about authorizing, both by command and precedent, the use of instruments. So the command to sing in the Old Testament was not understood to be exclusive of instrumental music because there were also commands about the instruments and either or both combined could be used appropriately. But you don't have that pattern in the New Testament. You have only the one and not the other. And against the precedent for instrumental music, both within Judaism and within Greek backgrounds, I believe that specific authorization of only one form of musical praise is reasonably understood to have exclusionary intent. And I believe that becomes intensified when you study some of the history of the early period and realize that with the early church's worship model on the synagogue rather than on the temple, and with the rabbis arguing for a cappella music in the synagogue for very specific reasons that are consistent with the nature of worship as it is defined for Christians in the New Testament, that you find exclusionary intent. And that it's not a matter of mental gymnastics on our part to try to come up with a weird and, and peculiar position within Christendom to be opposed to instrumental music. 
In fact, our position in the early days in the United States was the dominant position. And this afternoon in the third session, I'll share some material with you that I did not discover until a few months ago about musicology in, in the early colonies and what a general brouhaha there was about the introduction of instrumental music into the Presbyterian and Baptist and Methodist churches and the bitter, bitter struggles there. If you think some of the language and debates we had were acerbic, you should go back and read some of those. In fact, I found a book in the Vanderbilt Library that I believe was the in the left-hand middle drawer of some of these early guys in our movement who debated the issue because the arguments and positions they take, both the good ones and the very poor ones, are in that book written by a Presbyterian minister arguing against the introduction of instrumental music into his denomination. And I think, I think they had that. And I think that was a source book for a lot of the early arguments that our folks were making. And unfortunately, they read off some of the bad pages as well as some of the pages that, that were better thought through. So, in this session, I've tried simply to outline the broad parameters of, of a hermeneutical principle that has been part and parcel of our restoration heritage and that I believe is correct. And I think if we move away from that hermeneutical principle, we buy much more than a concessive posture toward instrumental music. I think we buy into things that we will be altogether unwilling to accept because we know from our general acquaintance with Scripture we are moving off of solid footing and moving out of the realm of New Testament precedent. So that principle that I've called the authority principle says that we have to look to Scripture not as a blueprint for every detail of the life of the church. It's just not that. And not as a set of, of articulated laws in casebook fashion so that we become legalists looking for a law to regulate every position. Now, Scripture has sometimes been used that way by some of us. Scripture is not intended as that. Scripture is an insight into the mind of God with regard to the salvation process as to how he has acted lovingly and graciously in history to bring us to redemption. And from the precedent of the life of that early church, we get the insights into what is essential before God for people to come before him in integrity for praise and worship and service. And I believe that since Scripture is held to furnishes completely unto every good work. We have to be very, very careful in how we deal with Scripture and ask the question not where is it prohibited, but where is it authorized? And at the same time, careful to the other extreme, not to read exclusionary intent into every statement or commandment of Scripture, but to put that statement or command of Scripture in its total historic linguistic context, and only if there is good cause for seeing exclusionary intent, use that statement to oppose something outside what's specifically stated. And I think the inability to deal with that specific issue well is why, as a restoration movement, we have fractured and fragmented and continued to do so, and for, and for the foreseeable future, we'll continue to do so. Because a great deal of subjectivity gets into it, and when the subjectivity gets into it, very quickly personalities get into it. And rival groups and loyalties begin to form. So, that principle, not yet articulated terribly well in our movement, though it has been critical to the whole idea of restoration, is something that this generation is going to have to face up to very directly and forthrightly. Either to say that it's legitimate for these more articulate reasons than we've given before or else to back away from and to admit not just instruments but a lot of other things and to take our place within a, a general denominational framework. But if we think we have anything unique and distinctive to offer, if we think restoration as a principle is legitimate, and if we think there's anything out of this hermeneutic that's proper, and I believe both the principle and hermeneutic are proper,
that I think we're going to have to articulate it much more carefully than we have. And we're going to apply it, have to apply it with much more consistency and with less intense subjectivity than we have in the two or three generations immediately prior to our own. Well, in the afternoon session, we're going to talk about linguistic data, and we'll go to biblical texts more in a more detailed way. And then in the late afternoon session, we'll talk about the historical data and, and some of the material I particularly want to get to out of early even American church history that I think probably uh, most of us would not be familiar with. Let me close and, and maybe allow just a couple of minutes if we have it for a question or two if you want to get them in with something that I hope would set this whole thing in both larger and lighter perspective. Some of you know the name Garrison Keeler. Used to listen to his PBS program, Prairie Home Companion, maybe you've read his Lake Wobegon days or other writings. Keeler is an American humorist that a lot of us have, have gotten fond of. And his humor is in the tradition of a Mark Twain, but, but not as acidy as a rule as Twain's. And a great deal of his work reflects the spiritual values out of his background. He's from a restoration background. The Plymouth Brethren. The Brethren movement began in the early 19th century in England, rejecting all creeds and accepting the Bible alone as their guide in religion. They stressed simplicity in worship and unswerving commitment to the propagation of truth. But as so often happens, that sort of commitment frequently degenerates to infighting and unhappy divisions within the ranks of the people who accept principle. And as a humorist, Keeler points to the foibles of his own religious heritage and representing his past via a fictional town called Lake Wobegon and his spiritual heritage within a church that in his writings he calls the Sanctified Brethren. He dared to poke a little fun at something very serious. And though some of you may regard his words as sacrilegious, you might do well to remember that Jesus used similar humor in talking about things like specks and planks and people's eyes. And when I read Keeler's thinly veiled description of his personal past in Lake Wobegon in a chapter in that book called Protestant, I couldn't avoid thinking about my own experience with my restoration heritage. Growing up within the historical framework of a unity movement, I lived and breathed division, even comfortable with it for a time, because strict separation tends to create a strong sense of identity with those who are like you and an equally strong sense of security and desire to exclude those who differ. And the sense of identity and security may sometimes simply try to protect us against the pain of isolation that, that we feel. I'm not too sure about that. But I want to read this to set it in a little bit lighter tone as we close and to get back to what I said at the beginning. While I believe this issue of instrumental music is important within our heritage, I do not believe it is a foundation issue like the deity of Christ or baptism. Keeler says, We were exclusive brethren a branch that believed in keeping itself pure of false doctrine by avoiding association with the impure. We made sure that any who fellowshiped with us were straight on all the details of the faith as set forth by the first brethren who left the Anglican Church in 1865 to worship on the basis of correct principles. Unfortunately, though, once free of the worldly Anglicans, these firebrands were not content to worship in peace but turned their guns on one another. Scholarly to the core and perfect literalists everyone, they set to arguing over points that to any outsider would have seemed very minor indeed, but which to them were crucial to the faith, including the question, if believer A is associated with believer B, who has somehow associated himself with C, who holds false doctrine, must D break off association with A, even though A doesn't hold the doctrine in order to avoid the taint? Well, the correct answer is yes. Some brethren, however, felt that D should only speak with A and urge him to break off with B. The brethren who felt otherwise promptly broke off from them. This was the Bedford question. 
one of several controversies that inside of two years split the brethren into three branches. Once having tasted the pleasure of being correct and defending true doctrine, they kept right on and broke up at every opportunity until by the time I came along, there were dozens of brethren groups, none of which were speaking to any of the others. Well, in caricature, we can laugh about Keeler's background. But if you reflect on it, the caricature is of people closer to home. And while issues like Sunday school and hats and versions and I think more significantly, instrumental music. A part and parcel of our heritage, I do not believe that the next step is one that's mandated. Where we have to anathematize, and where we have to sit in harsh judgment, and where we have to avoid all contact and refuse to acknowledge as brothers and when we talk about whether there are churches of Christ in an area, say, no, nope, there aren't any if they're in any way tainted from the core beliefs that, that we accept in our congregations that, that we want to call the mainstream, but mainstream depends on where you're flowing, of course. I think the larger issue, I think the larger issue with regard to the restoration principle is whether or not there are some things that at a more foundational level allow us to have communion and fellowship in Christ even though at a practical level we may not on every issue have a sense of need or compulsion to endorse or participate in everything that the other brother does. Well, in the congregation where you worship, you do that all the time. And you talk about Brother So-and-So is one of the godliest men you know, but boy, he has some harebrained views on, and then you name it. War, divorce, or whatever. Eschatology. I think the instrument question is significant. I think it is unduly significant to us because of our historical heritage, and I think we've made it a red flag issue among us that in the minds of a lot of us has the same priority as the confession of the deity of Christ and, and receiving believers' baptism as a penitent adult. I think while we try to get our heads clearer about a legitimation of our reasons for a cappella music, we need at the same time to be sure that we're doing it within a context of appreciation of the larger principle about the things that are truly foundational that cause one to be in Christ and the way we will treat those brothers that we regard as wrong or unfaithful on a specific tenet of doctrine or practice in worship. And it's only when we're, we're willing to address all of them simultaneously that we're faithful to the really healthy part of the heritage we've received as restorationists. And I hope today will make some contribution to both, both to articulating a precise case on one point and to urging a larger attitude and culture in which we can hold, teach, defend without apology that view and yet treat in a brotherly way those who are also in the body of Christ and who differ on this point. I think our time is precisely up at this point, and so I will give you leave to be on to the next hours class. Am I right that at, at 20 after we dismiss? Thanks. Appreciate your being here. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this content and if you want to see more of it, please leave a like on the video and be sure to leave a comment underneath telling us what you thought about the video. And please subscribe to our channel for more content like this. All right. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.